I heard that you once rented a Turo with flames painted on it for a road trip with two of your sons. I did. I was taking a road trip down to San Diego. Like all bad decisions, they start when your wife isn't there. We had an idea about the radius for which a host would deliver the vehicle. And that radius was, well, no one's going to deliver more than 50 miles. I thought, well, maybe that's just an anomalous behavior. I said, do any of you all deliver more than 50 miles? And like all of them raise their hand. So wow. it was just a humbling experience that there's common sense of what you think. And then there's the reality and staying close to your customers can bring you closer to that reality. Voice of customer. Sometimes people joke and call it voice of CEO. And I'm guilty of that too, right? So when a situation yeah. where you have the CEO in the room advocating for an idea and you obviously have other ideas, how do you go about balancing? Well, the first thing I would say for product leaders out there is choose your CEOs very carefully. If you have CEOs whose ego gets in the way of customer feedback, that can be problematic. Hey, hey, this is Carlos, CEO at Product School and your host on the Product Podcast. Today's guest is Tom Wang. Chief Product Officer at Turo, the leading car rental marketplace. Often described as the Airbnb for cars, Turo empowers car owners to lease their vehicles for rent while providing renters with a seamless way to book directly from these owners. Turo's incredible growth trajectory has led to nearly a billion dollars in annual revenue and the company is preparing to go public. During our conversation, we deep dive into the intricacies of structuring a product org for a marketplace, how to build a strong product culture, the KPIs for marketplace success, and how to tackle the most critical marketplace challenges, such as consistent supply quality at scale. Let's get started. Welcome to the show, Tom. Glad to be here. So I heard that you once rented a Turo with flames painted on it for a road <laughs> trip with two of your sons. <laughs> I did. I was taking a road trip down to San Diego. And uh, like all bad decisions, they start when your wife isn't there. So my wife wasn't there and I rented a car with flames on it, a Turo, for me and my son because I thought it would be uh, fun. I have two sons. So uh, we enjoyed it. We had a great time. And as we were returning it, my younger son uh, started crying and was just being difficult. And I couldn't really understand what he was saying. And But I was getting frustrated. And uh, I asked my older son, what, what's going on? And he said, he's saying my car, my car, because it resembled uh, a toy car he had at home. And so he was crying and it just illustrated for me, for Turo, uh, that uh, the unique selection at Turo is, creates emotional connections with our customers. And uh, I can't say this for sure, but I think it's unlikely that anyone's ever cried returning a traditional rental car. And so, uh, you know, using the service itself, you know, people talk about eating your own dog food. I think, of course, it can uncover problems, but it can also uncover the joys of your product. Yeah. And I think some people might have cried, but maybe for different reasons, right? Of, of ha <laughs> happiness. <laughs> but let, let's talk about Perhaps. that, right? What, what, what is Turo? Uh, Turo is a car rental marketplace. So for our hosts, the people with the cars, most of the time, there are 1.5 billion cars on the planet. And most of the time, those cars are idle. You know, they're, they're not going anywhere. And so that central premise is the basis of our marketplace is to make better use of those 1.5 billion cars. And what hosts do is our entrepreneur hosts is they rent out their cars and it's a great platform for them to either make money as a side hustle or um, have a full-time independence and gig of themselves. On the guest side, so the people who are renting the cars, we offer unbelievable unique selection as illustrated by my uh, story about my young son and any type of car at any budget. It's, you know, uh, uh, you can get at the lower range, a mini or a Subaru or uh, a VW, or you can go to a more bougie car, more expensive car. But no matter what price point you're at, you can get amazing selection. And then there's the amazing convenience. Um, anywhere there's a car, there can be a Turo, whereas traditional rental car is limited by their physical presence. So for guests, it's amazing convenience and selection. For hosts, it's a great platform to monetize their vehicles. 
basically as a marketplace or we could think of Airbnb for, for cars, even though I'm not a big fan of using another company's name to compare to other, but like, that's a similar concept, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, we, of course, love Airbnb. It's a, a trailblazing marketplace. And we both have our inception back in what people used to call the sharing economy. Um, now they just call them marketplaces. But that idea of, um, you know, unlocking the amazing uh, selection that exists out there and uh, bringing people together, consumers together in a, a unique way. Um, and yeah, it's, uh, it's, there are a lot of great marketplaces out there that we take um, uh, inspiration from. But uh, as I've learned from Turo, because I've been there for 11 years, you need to chart your own course. You can't just, uh, you know, e every marketplace has its unique uh, contours. Totally. And, and hopefully you get to a point where people define their own companies as the Turo 4 X. <laughs> we've had it. We've already had it uh, uh, so, sometimes, but you know, we're we're just focused for now on you know, uh, people can compare us to whomever they wish. We're focused on um, you know a great experience for our hosts and our guests. So I see your company was started in two thousand and nine, and they're a different name, Relay Rides. As Relay you Rides. You've been at the company Turo for eleven years, uh, mm -hmm. right when the company raised Series A. Mm -hmm. That's correct. So how did the product team look like when, when you joined? <laughs> it was uh, fledgling. Uh, so it was just myself and two other product managers. And we had one designer. 11 years later, tell me more about <laughs> what the product team looks like. I mean, there's a lot more <clears throat> specialization um, and it's a lot larger. I mean, now we have different domains. We have uh, whole domains focused on the host side, the guest side, the risk side of the business, um, to the trip experience itself. We have um, a design team that not only has uh, UX designers, but also has a design systems team. We have a whole UX research team. So it, it's upwards of uh, 70 and 80 people. And so you mentioned within design, you have design, design system, UX research? Yes. Uh, what other functions are, are, are part of what you consider product? Um, and then product management, which is the other uh, the, the, uh, large function. But those are the basics. Um, you know, engineering is a separate organization, but obviously there are partners. So when we think about product, usually we think about engineering, data, and then the product group, which I mentioned. Those are all part of product regardless of who they report to, we're all a team that's focused on the same, uh, trying to advance the product. And, and how do you structure the different squads or, or units? Given that you are a marketplace, do you have teams focused on different sides of the marketplace, uh, the user life cycle or other types of considerations? Um, mainly the, 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 the three main divisions are uh, guests. So focused on the, the, the people who are renting the car. And there's a lot of different specializations within that, depending where they are in the funnel. Um, there's the actual trip experience of the guest. And then there's finding the vehicles that, that they want. So there are lots of subdivisions within that. And then there's the host side of the marketplace, which has different dimensions, some of which uh, are meant to help hosts operate more efficiently. Some of them are organized to help hosts price their vehicles properly and so on. And then there's a, a third group, which is risk, which is focused on protection, which is a key part of our marketplace, which is, um, you know, what sort of protection we offer to our guests and to our hosts, uh, what sort of packages uh, to ensure that we have a safe marketplace that people feel comfortable with. Because I remember, and I was an early, early user of your company, probably before it was called Turo, that mm -hmm. the product was mostly focused on daily rentals, uh, and there was a hardware component, right? Like you literally had Absolutely. to go and open that <laughs> thing manually. So tell me a little bit more about how does your product, ha how has the product evolved over those 10, 11 years? And what, have, what are some of those pivotal moments? Uh, sometimes it seems like another lifetime ago, uh, because I, of course, remember those days. Um, I think in those early days, you could even equate it to a peer-to-peer -peer zip car. You know, that was sort of the model of it to the way you describe it. And there are several problems with that model. 
Um, same mission, which was to put the 1.5 billion cars to better use. But when people rented out uh, cars hourly, uh, it was the unit economics were troubling because uh, during that time, there's, you know, there's a risk that something can happen and they're driving it the entire time. And then on the revenue side, hosts are not making that much money by renting it out hourly. So we gradually navigated toward uh, our bread and butter now, which is more leisure travel, you know, uh, three to seven days. Uh, that's a, a big segment for us people traveling. That gives the host enough revenue that it's worth it and um, makes the exchange of the vehicle a bit more uh, flexible. Um, and the other thing is I think ride sharing actually fills that niche of I need to uh, go get groceries. I just need to go to the grocery store and go back. That sort of hourly rental is not as interesting to us. For us, if you take a trip to Lake Tahoe or take a local vacation, you want that continuity of the vehicle. You want to be able to put stuff in it. You want to be able to park it. You want to be able to go with it to different places. So having that exclusive access to that vehicle uh, is really important to what makes the marketplace tick. Yeah, and I think what you are defining right now, which is your ideal persona on the guest side, is, is critical for many marketplaces because you can get a lot of volume and it's important to optimize for a certain segment. Um, so I remember having this conversation with a, uh, a product leader at Airbnb. They also designed their specific personas for guests and they also add the same for the hosts. So in your case, like, what is your ideal host persona? Uh, the ideal host is an entrepreneur. Um, so that's one thing that we discovered early is that we were always trying to make it easier to uh, rent your car out. And we still have that goal to make it easier to rent your car out. But what we came to appreciate is in order to run a high quality marketplace, and that's one thing we aspire to with Turo, we're not a Craigslist. Craigslist is a wonderful marketplace, but, you know, it's a different sort of marketplace. Uh, there's a lot of trust that's required for uh, renting out a car. And so we want it to be a high quality marketplace. And in order to run a high quality marketplace, we really need to ensure these hosts are motivated and, and they have both the understanding of how to uh, properly provide the, the vehicle at the right time, at the right place for the right price. And also they're properly motivated. So they're committed to Turo. And they're well prepared. And so an entrepreneur who has both is set up well in Turo. Someone whose commitment is mediocre um, is not going to deliver a great guest experience. Uh, guests expect the car to be where they want it to be, when they want it to be. And so we have a high standard for hosts um, and they can make a lot of money, but we have the standard for their commitment and their understanding of what it takes to deliver a great experience. Totally. And I think that's a a challenge and an opportunity for a lot of marketplaces is to be able to still provide a consistent, high quality experience, even though you do not always control the supply. Mm, absolutely. Um, you know, they don't work for us. They're not employees. They're our partners. They're our suppliers. And uh, they're the best source for customer insights. You know, they have that longitudinal relationship with the Turo marketplace. Uh, they use the app every day to make their living. And one of my favorite uh, parts of the year is we have a host summit for all our hosts. And we have some hosts who have 50, 100, more than 100 vehicles on Turo. And you go to uh, last time we had our host summit last fall in Austin, Texas. And you can talk to these hosts and they understand the product so well. And any idea that you can ideate on the product in some sort of ivory tower is completely blown out of the water when they come to you and they're like, this app needs to do this. And you say, well, let me explain to you. They go, no, 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 let me explain. The, I'm trying to get this car to do this. And they really sober you up. It's a wonderful hygienic experience because they're your users and it takes it out of the hypothetical and into the real. Yeah, well, can you share an example of like one of those moments where you were at an event with Turo host and like, and some of their ideas and how you were able to implement them into your product. Absolutely. I'll tell you one of my favorite. It was very early on. Uh, it was after Relay Rides, I think, <laughs> but still early going. 
we went down to one of our first community events in Southern California, and we had noticed uh, that hosts were delivering, delivering vehicles to the airport. It wasn't structured in our product, but we just noticed that was happening organically. So uh, as is often the case in the marketplace, you observe what's happening and then you add structure behind it in the software. So we had plans about uh, providing structure so that the hosts and guests could connect and the host could deliver their vehicle. We had an idea about the radius for which a host would deliver the vehicle. And that radius was, well, no one's going to deliver more than 50 miles, let's say. Uh, and we wanted to make it a reasonable amount. So uh, I remember it so distinctly. There was a, a table of hosts who were talking about, and I was sharing with them our plans. And I mentioned that, you know, we're thinking a radius of 50 miles. And they both, the, the, they started to look at one another. And one woman said, well, I deliver cars to Las Vegas. This is from Los Angeles. And I was like, what? What do you mean? Why would you deliver the why would you deliver a vehicle to uh, Las Vegas? They go, well, sometimes the, she had very high end cars, very high end uh, BMWs. Sometimes a very rich person will come into Las Vegas and they'll pay me to actually deliver the car there. And I thought, well, maybe that's just an anomalous behavior. I said, do any of you all deliver more than 50 miles? And like all of them raise their hand. So wow. it was just a humbling experience that there's common sense of what you think, and then there's the reality. And staying close to your customers can bring you closer to that reality. Yeah, I believe there is no replacement for, for some of those moments, right? You really want to be there using the product, talking to the people who use the product. And the challenge that I see is, as, as obviously your, your company is operating at a much bigger volume, how do you orchestrate some of that feedback loop in a way that you can ensure that you're also not missing other things and maybe create some mechanisms for people to deliver that feedback automatically without requiring the CPO to show up to a user's event? <laughs> well, I mean, some of it is training, which is we train all our product people to immerse themselves in customer data. It's not only you know qualitative uh, stories like I told you, but there's also uh, obviously quantitative information about what people are doing and observing what they're doing on the platform. So I think um, uh, speaking with people who speak with customers every day, so we have a claims team, we have a customer support team, we have host success managers who work directly with our entrepreneurial hosts. Um, I really encourage our product people to have open lines of communications with these groups because they're critical to keep you honest. Uh, you marry that with the quantitative information and the proactive UX research. And, you know, I always try to say we, we crave data, but we're not a slave to data. So I think you don't want to be crippled by an inability to act because you don't have definitive information. But data should help inspire you and help shape the direction of where you want to go. And that just requires constant vigilance and curiosity. We have a Slack channel called Voice of the Customer. And in that Slack channel, anyone, even our BPOs, um, you know, we not only have customer service agents, but we work with different um, outsourced customer service agents. And they can, if they are talking to customer, and they uh, see something that's noteworthy, they can just re you know, remark on it in voice of the customer. And you'll find myself there, you'll find our CEO there, just observing and answering questions and talking about it. And when you model that behavior for your team, they crave it as well. So um, I think there's a lot of training and uh, signaling to them about staying close to customers. And here is a challenge for you with this. So voice, voice of customer, sometimes people joke and call it voice of CEO. <laughs> and I'm guilty of that too, right? So when in a situation yeah. where you have the CEO in the room advocating for an idea and you obviously have mm -hmm. other ideas, other people, like how do you go about balancing uh, the type of feedback that you're receiving so they can be you know, prioritized appropriately on a roadmap? Uh, so, well, the first thing I would say for product leaders out there is choose your CEOs very carefully. So uh, that's the first step, because if you have CEOs whose ego gets in the way of customer feedback, uh, that can be problematic. I'm lucky at Turo, and one of the reasons I've been here so long is 
uh, our CEO has a lot of uh, humility about uh, staying close to customers. And there's nothing that's actually more persuasive to him than customer feedback. Um, so uh, that's the first thing. But uh, uh, you know, to address your point more directly, uh, when there is a point of view about a vision, whether it comes from the CEO or from me that conflicts with customer uh, data, you know, I think there's a need to harmonize the two. And there usually is a harmony. You have to find that angle on it. Um, I think we all need to be flexible about uh, how we think about problems. There's a great quote by John Maynard Keyes, which I like, uh, which is the thing about creativity is not about coming up with new ideas. It's escaping the old ideas. And a lot of times we have ideas in our head about the way things are, like I did about the delivery radius or what have you. And so it just is having that mindset where you can be flexible. Um, maybe the overall principle or vision stays the same, but customer feedback can help adjust it. Yeah, to me, it comes down to creating the right environment, the right product culture, if you will, where there is psychological safety. So people can feel safe sharing something without the fear of, oh my God, am I going to be fired? Or like, <laughs> should I give up early because my manager has a different idea? So how do you go about creating that type of healthy product culture? I think one of the things is to celebrate uh, learnings more than um, necessarily wins. So I think when people are transparent about what they've learned from something that they've done, that um, gets a lot of praise from me. Um, you know, we tested this, we tried this, we learned this, it didn't work. That I think creates a feeling of psychological safety that it's not about trying to hide uh, the reality of the situation for political reasons. You just, we're all learning together. We all make mistakes. Um, we all have ideas about the way things are and we try them. And through our craft and our um, effort, we uh, try to improve things for customers and the, the, the marketplace. And so I think it's a constant, um, it, it's, it'd be wonderful uh, to say that, you know, ego and politics don't get in the way of things. And of course, you know, I don't live in a dream world where I know that's not the case. But I, I think I have seen this a number of times that people think by just doing what I say or the CEO says, that's going to be successful. But actually, the most successful people at Turo I have found are the people who challenge us um, uh, successfully and persuade us a different way. Those are the people who, who do well. And one thing we're lucky at, at Turo is we have some product people. A lot of our leaders have been here a long time. I've been here a long time. Um, but we also have other people who've been here nine years, eight years, seven years. A lot of our leadership has been there. So there is that sense of trust with one another uh, that we're OK to to call uh, BS on one another and be like, that's not true. <laughs> I, I think that is a great um, leading indicator of a healthy culture, like the tenure of employees, especially senior folks, because it shows that you know, like these are people who have options, right? If they don't like something, they can go somewhere else. So they are choosing to stay for a reason. Yeah, I, um, I think so. So um, some of our great leaders, uh, Anshul, Roy, uh, Jeff, Praveen, these are all people who've been here six plus years and they all bring something different to the table. Some are more process oriented. Um, uh, you know, some are, uh, you know, more quantitative oriented. Some are more action oriented. Some are more cautious. And we just try to play off one another's uh, strengths. Let's talk about how to bring people to the conversation, right? Some of those rising stars you may have on your team. Like, how do you go about upskilling or coaching them so they can also be influential into your overall product strategy? Even though we have a number of people with tenure, I try not to lean on that too much in terms of share of voice. So in other words, even though it's accurate that we have people with a lot of tenure, I feel like we make a lot of effort for people who just joined to encourage them to speak up during meetings. We have uh, different processes, including something called a concept review. And during those concept reviews, you bring what you're working on, you show the divergent paths that you're working on, and we discuss uh, different options. 
And in that meeting and in other meetings, you know, you don't want the people who are long tenured to monopolize the discussion. And so, um, of course, I don't want to self-censor and not give any point of view, but I think it's really important that other people feel comfortable sharing their point of view. And so uh, modeling that for the people who are presenting at Concept Review and um, sort of breaking down the hierarchical barriers. We're just three people in a room with a whiteboard trying to figure this out together. Yeah, I like that concept of uh, the concept review. And uh, is there any type of prep that you expect people to do so this can be, you know, as actionable as, as possible? Yeah, um, we uh, and we're constantly refining it. I wouldn't say we've perfected it. But one of the things we really request is it's not only to socialize the work that they're doing, but they diverge. So they say these are three viable paths that we can take and we want your feedback on it because we're leading toward this recommended approach. And so we have, a, you know, different templates uh, that are designed. I mean, we have a lot of flexibility, but that are designed for people to present that divergent point of view. And as I joke with the team, sometimes you don't want to present something where it's like, well, this is a terrible idea. This is a worse idea. And this is a great idea. What do you all think? <laughs> that's not you that's not useful. You want three authentically different approaches that are all viable. Yeah. Um I, I call that a mini board meeting. I try to do that for <laughs> my product teams too, because that's how I like to approach my own board meetings, right? Like I, I present different scenarios to the board and I always share my point of view on one of them. Uh, and then we discuss. So I expect my teams to do the same. Like, what do you think? And then we can discuss. Because if you just present ideas, you don't have enough skin in the game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's definitely the case. The most successful concept reviews that I've experienced um, are light on background and heavy on divergence. So sometimes there could be a tremendous amount of throat clearing, like 40 pages of background and two pages of choices. Okay, well, you know, most of the people in the room have enough background. So one thing we've done is now we have pre-read. So we say, here, set, send all the background beforehand. And then when you come in, there's a very brief, okay, we've done the pre-read. Now let's get down into the meat of, of the way things are. I think people have a lot of pride in the amount of work they do. And so they want to share that. And I appreciate that. I've worked really hard to analyze this situation. I want to share it. But what I tell them is, we know you've worked hard. That's why we hired you. Uh, we expect you to do all that work, um, but you don't need to present it. We believe you just get to the, the decisions. Yeah, I, I resonate with that because I, I see that constantly. Like the expectation of an executive is to get the least amount of information possible and trust as much as possible in that person. <laughs> but sometimes that contributor really wants to show the amount of work they put into this data. <laughs> And it's kind of disrespectful, right, to, to bring all of that and expect that someone is going to stop their life to go and analyze it. I always tell my team, like, try to bring the insights, not just the data. Just tell me, analyze mm -hmm. it, tell me what you think about it, and we can discuss it. But like, don't put me to work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, like I said, I think uh, people have a lot of pride in the amount of work that they've done. So I understand the instincts. And you just have to give them that confidence that say, we know you've done great work. We yeah. assume you've done great work. Let's get down to brass tacks. Yeah, that, that's where I think a lot of PRDs became useless back in the day because they just got too long. And the expectation for a lot of uh, PMs was that, well, I'm going to send this to my engineers and they are going to magically read everything and understand. And no, 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 no. <laughs> like, I think there's magic in simplicity, right? And especially in the product function, like we truly need to make an extra effort to simplify, to digest information and make it easier for others to do their best work. Absolutely. I agree. Well, let's talk about your, your product as, as it evolves. I understand that in addition to your B2C business, you are also in the B2B space, right? Well, in a way, um, you know, I think our entrepreneurs are in some way small businesses. Um, so uh, we, we're not business to business in a large way, but in some ways, because there are suppliers and they are businesses. Um, if someone has 50, 100 cars, what we're building for them is essentially a SaaS product more than a consumer product. 
um, because they're running inventory management, pricing, you know, claims handling, all the things that they need to do. And we're providing a, a SaaS uh, product. So in that regard, we're business to business in that we have an SMB product, uh, a SaaS product for our hosts. On the guest side, it's pretty cut and dry and being consumer. So some of these features that you introduce, such as the monthly pricing, like tell mm -hmm. me more about that SaaS element to your marketplace. You, you mentioned the past of where we came from. Where we came from is a place where it's one car and you're renting it out hourly. But now if you imagine you have 50 cars and you have a fleet that you're managing and you mentioned uh, monthly discounts and we have different duration discounts uh, that incentivize longer trips. You maybe want to change them for the entire fleet. You don't want to have to go in by car by car. So, OK, now these features that we've built um, where you're willing to deliver. Um, what uh, your duration discounts are, they all have to work in such a way that uh, uh, hosts can manage their all their inventory simultaneously. And that interface can get complex without a lot of focused UX uh, work. And when you think about KPIs the, for, for your marketplace, like what are some of those key leading indicators to revenue? I'm thinking GMV and other kind of key metrics for you to know that you're running a, a healthy business? Um, well, <laughs> one of ours is just conversion, not to be too uh, uh, simplistic about it, but the way we measure conversion is search to book net of cancellations. So when you order something on Amazon, I mean, it could be canceled, but it's unlikely and it will likely be fulfilled. With us, we provide a flexible product for our guests uh, to compete with traditional rental car. So guests can cancel. And of course, hosts, sometimes circumstances happen. Maybe the, the car got into an accident or something like that. So we always look at a conversion in sort of search to book net of cancellations. Conversion also um, expresses uh, what sort of supply liquidity we have. Because if you have supply that's attractive, and well-priced conversion goes up. If you lack supply or it's unattractive, conversion goes down. So uh, in terms of the health of the marketplace, uh, conversion is a wonderful uh, leading health indicator uh, about how Turo is doing. And what about the liquidity of the marketplace? So the, the GMV? Uh, yeah, I mean, of course, uh, GBV, we call it GBV, gross booking value, is an important thing as well, too. Uh, search to book net of cancellation is generally in terms of volume. And then GBV is in terms of, obviously, the actual uh, booking value. We track that as well, and it's uh, also extremely important. And, you know, within that, there are lots of different dimensions, including average trip value. On the host side, we really work on host fulfillment. Um, you know, people expect fulfillment to be 100%. And that's not an unreasonable expectation for a guest. I booked it. I should get it. And so we have worked tirelessly to try to constantly up-level our supply so that we can provide that reliability of, uh, of fulfillment. Yeah, I want to talk with you about some of the marketplace risks. So, for example, uh, you mentioned before, insurance, right? Like as a host, like I am putting my vehicle in the market and a lot of different people are, are using it. So look, how do you go about covering for that need? Well, first, uh, you know, we, we couldn't have gotten where we are. We have billions of dollars of GBV without, you know, thinking carefully about this for our hosts. So the safety of the marketplace is one of the core things that we offer. And uh, we offer different uh, packages for them based on their risk tolerance. So um, the larger our take rate is, the lower their deductible will be. But if they are willing to uh, absorb more of the risk and have a higher deductible, then they can uh, increase their take rate uh, quite a bit. And so different hosts have different profile, and we want them to be comfortable with the risk profile that uh, they have. Uh, this all said, I will say back to sort of host research, I asked a host once if they could go back in time, this is a host with hundreds of cars, to when they first got on Turo, how would you think differently? And the way they described it, which I think is wonderfully accurate for a host is, 
Um, the cars are, uh, they're, they're not pets, they're cattle. Um, because uh, if you think of them as pets, then it's sort of very difficult. You're like, oh, my car, it, it's just an asset that you're trying to um, you know, rent out and monetize. And uh, after thousands of trips, there will be a ding or something will happen. And that's where Turo really needs to step up and make sure that we're providing that level of protection that we said we would. And hosts over time adjust to their level of risk. Another classic situation is uh, a guest skipping the platform, right? Trying to go directly to the supplier after a first successful interaction. So how do you create enough value so the guests want to stay? I perceive Turo is somewhat blessed in this regard that um, I think it's less of an issue for us in some marketplace. I used for my wife's birthday once a chef marketplace, which was wonderful. But afterwards, the chef said to me, hey, just book me directly in the past. I'm like, what about the marketplace? He's like, well, I don't care about the marketplace. With Turo, you know, I think the intermediation of protection for both the guests and the hosts is a critical reason why people stay within the platform. It would be uh, really foolhardy to do that without that protection, really. Yeah, I think that is such a critical component in many marketplaces, right? They have a good first interaction and then they don't have enough skin in the game. Maybe the host doesn't have enough skin in the game and they just go directly. So I think if you're able to build enough value and, and, and brand and loyalty at the end of the day, you, you can continue investing in, in that platform. Otherwise, it becomes too transactional. Yeah, absolutely. I, um, <laughs> I think we're trying to build the best pl a hosting platform for our entrepreneur hosts. I mentioned that we're trying to build great efficiency tools. We obviously want to bring them the best leads because uh, we're lead gen for them. You know, They get business. It's not just tools to manage their fleet. They get business. We provide protection. We uh, recently offered two new services for our hosts, which we think are really uh, valuable. One is uh, financing, because conventional, uh, conventional loan products for buying cars are not oriented toward people by, uh, you know, creating fleets. So we're connecting them to lenders uh, for our uh, larger hosts. And then another thing is off-trip insurance. So when someone is delivering the vehicle or otherwise driving the vehicle, um, offering them an insurance product, which is more well-suited to a business versus uh, a consumer product, uh, where consumer insurance products are not meant for commercial use. So uh, by staying close to our hosts, we can constantly up-level and um, we really feel, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> Our host success is our success, and they're our lifeblood. So we really uh, work closely with them. We listen to them. Like any close couple, sometimes there are disagreements, um, but we work through them together. Yeah, there are some non-negotiables, and I think that is a really good analogy. And I actually learned this lesson from the VP of product from Upwork, a marketplace for freelancers and, and employers. And uh, he said something, when I asked him about this question on how do you actually protect the mass marketplace so people don't skip you, he said, well, we go one step beyond. And it's not just about protecting it, but also making it so much valuable for the, for the host that they actually want to bring external business into the platform. <laughs> so Upwork actually al allows that companies would want to bring freelancers into the platform, even if they didn't find those freelancers on Upwork. I think that's a, a it's an inspirational standard, and uh, that sounds uh, that uh, I I completely appreciate that mentality. Um, I know you have a hot take here on, on on quality, and you said that marketplaces <laughs> can aspire to and surpass a retail experience. Can you elaborate on that? I mentioned the story before about the amazing selection that Turo can offer that a traditional rental car can't for its uh, because of the nature of the business model. But, you know, re when people shop retail, uh, mostly guests don't care about your business model. They care about what value you're bringing. And <clears throat> I think that there's a lot of predictability in retail. And so uh, we want to strive for that. We can't use a marketplace as our excuse to say, well, we can't because guests have certain expectations. And our view of it is the guest expectation is push button, get car. 
in an in a nutshell. That's the retail experience. So, um, you know, we recently um, sunset uh, a format called Request a Book, which uh, had been around a long time for Turo, which is um, I want your car. And then the host says, yes, you can book my car. We sunset that because what guests want to do is just I want your car click. It's booked. And so now 100 percent of our marketplace is instant book. And that's all in service of this uh, emulating the the retail experience. So we want to take the best of retail. And I think great marketplaces like Amazon do this. We want to emulate the best of retail in terms of convenience and simplicity, but all the good of a marketplace, the uh, amazing selection and the, uh, in our case, a diversity of selections. Um, We want both. Uh, might be greedy, but we want both. And we think we can get there and are getting there. It is possible. Obviously, we have examples with uh, Airbnb and, and other incredible marketplaces. It's just the, the initial traction is so hard, right? As a marketplace, uh, you you technically can move faster because you don't control all the supply, but also you are sharing revenue. So if you are able to get to a certain volume where you have all this supply, uh you can still share revenue, but still be a dominant player. It is possible to win on both fronts. Yeah, I uh, I believe so. I think it's like the central premise of any modern marketplace is to take all the benefits of a marketplace and uh, emulate uh, the, the retail predictability. If you can do that, you're in a really good spot. Yeah, so as you think about the positioning of your, of your product today, Obviously, compared doesn't matter how maybe in the past it was more about oh peer to peer marketplace whatnot like at the end of the day a customer wants a car like in a, such a competitive environment where there's so many other players out there like how do you position your product? The good news is there hasn't been that much innovation on the guest side in traditional rental car in a very long time. So we're we're competing against a player whose NPS in, is not particularly high <laughs> and uh, who uh, has not. Uh, innovated that much. And so I think, I know I've said it, but it it really, there's a lot of dimensions to it. But I think our unique selection and our unbeatable convenience together are the central differentiators for Turo. In addition to those, I think there are certain dimensions that represent a modern sensibility. There's a rental counter and people don't like rental counters, and then there's an app. And so do you want the rental counter or do you want the app? And Turo is the app. <laughs> oh, I'm smiling, but I should cry because I, I, I <laughs> picture myself, you know, at the airport in a long line saying, please, is there an app like kind of like a Starbucks, right? Because you can do the mobile <laughs> order and skip the line. <laughs> Well, uh, that's one of the benefits of, of Turo. And we're, you know, we're constantly, you know, we're humble about where we are and where we want to go. We think we've come a long way, but our aspirations uh, are to be uh, really um, uh, extraordinarily reliable. Um, and every inch, uh, every percentage point, every half percentage point is important to us. Uh, we believe we have a high quality marketplace today. But our aspirations are to to really be um, indisputably uh, wonderful as it relates to customers. Well, let's continue talking about those aspirations. I know that you recently <laughs> released uh, your summer update with so many different features. So, wh- what is what is next for you? Well, that summer update you referenced was very exciting because um, you mentioned, I think, earlier in our conversation uh, how sometimes. Uh, e-commerce or marketplace can have a transactional relationship versus more of a longitudinal one. And I think on the guest side, uh, the idea of browsing cars on a traditional rental car is nonsensical. Like, what do you mean browse cars? There's nothing to browse. It's a transactional relationship. With Turo, there are all sorts of wonderful cars, different colors and shapes and You know, there's a lot of creativity in the car industry. And so um, in the past, you had to put in dates and locations for browsing cars on Turo. But I perceive that a lot of people just have heard of Turo and they just want to get to know Turo and they just want to check out the cars. They might say, oh, do you have uh, Lamborghinis on Turo? 
and they don't have a specific trip in mind. They just want to look. So I think we're trying to unlock this browse experience by allowing you to search anywhere and with any dates. And then you can filter in different ways. We've added new collections, which sort of prepackage filters that might be interesting you to inspire you uh, a little bit. And uh, I think this is an exciting um, emphasis on our unique selection. Um, but, you know, our long term vision is wherever you go, there's, uh, you know, the perfect car for you. And every situation uh, can be uh, quite different. Every person is uh, different. But um, we just believe that commodities and rental counters will become more of a cottage industry and Turo will be the primary way that when you need access to a car for multiple dates, you get it. Tom, we both live in San Francisco Bay Area and we, we see driverless cars all around us. So <laughs> how, how far is that in the, in, in, the, in the future for you? Well, I think that um, Turo sometimes can people can be people's first exposure to a lot of automobile innovation. Um, so I know this isn't your question because uh, you didn't ask about EVs. You asked about, um, you know, uh, cars, self-driving cars. But I think a lot of people get their first exposure to EVs by renting an EV on Turo. Because, yo, I'm going to rent and Turo has the largest of any EV fleet. I think that some cars, you know, there's a range, obviously, of um, self-driving. Uh, there's full uh, automation and then there's partial automation. And many cars now that are available on Turo offer some form of self-driving, um, including obviously Teslas. Uh, we have a lot of Teslas on Turo. And so <laughs> I think that for going for point to point, it's more applicable for ride sharing. Um, and we don't operate in that world. But I think when you want a car for going to Tahoe, as I mentioned, or a multi-day trip, um, it's not about going point to point. It's about putting stuff in there and uh, doing what have you. So uh, we've keep, we have we think it's important, obviously, to keep our eye on it. But um, in the marketplace model, any innovations that occur in a vehicle show up on Turo first. If there's a new car, it'll show up on Turo before anywhere. And so um, I feel comfortable that as innovations reach uh, consumers, that uh, the the benefits of self-driving or partially self-driving cars are going to continue to show up on Turo's marketplace. Well, thank you so much for your time. This was a, a great opportunity to learn more about how you're thinking about product, marketplaces, and, and the future. Yeah, wonderful, uh, Carlos. And I look forward to you uh, taking out maybe a, a car with a flame with your, with your daughter next time you visit uh, San Diego. <laughs> Deal. <laughs> All right. 